The title slide fades in. The Computer Center for Visually Impaired People at Baruch College and CUNY present the Karen L. Gorgi Conference on Visual Impairment and Employment, Policy and Practice, Take Action. On the left is a picture of Jenny Leferi, Chief Accessibility Officer at Microsoft. At the bottom is the Baruch College CUNY logo on the left and the CCVIP logo on the right. Coming up, keynote speaker, Jenny Lay Furry. And now, the exciting, well, I think that was all pretty exciting, actually. Um, but now we are ready to um, welcome to our midst uh, Jenny Lay Fleury. Are we still good with London, Joe? Sounds like we're good. So I just want to read you a little bit of her bio, and, and then I, she will be ready to deliver her keynote to us, which is just thrilling. So Jenny Lay Fleury has a passion to see people reach their full potential, including people with disabilities. Jenny is the Chief Accessibility Officer at Microsoft, leading their effort to drive their product development and services and websites to empower people and organizations to achieve more. Her team is at the forefront of creating positive experiences that apply technology to make a difference in the world and in the lives of individuals from how, um, from how they support people with disabilities in employment to innovative technology that aims to revolutionize what's possible for people with disabilities. With help from her team and with the broader community at Microsoft, Jenny's many, many initiatives to empower people with disabilities both in and out of Microsoft are just astounding. Uh, they include things like creating the Disability Answer Desk, which some of us might know, which provides specialist customer support to people with disabilities, to hosting the annual Microsoft Ability Summit, which focuses on empowering attendees. Um, 800 people apparently attended this last one. Um, and inclusive, innovative thinking necessary to enable people around the world. Also instrumental in projects such as Soundscape, which we might hear a little bit about, and the Microsoft Ability Hackathon, which has supported over 270 hackathon teams focused on empowering people with disabilities with new technologies and capabilities. Now, outside of Microsoft, Jenny is the current board chair of a really important group known as the Business Leadership Network that has all to do with uh, hiring of people with disabilities. And she was recognized by the White House as a champion for change in October 2015. And I really want to thank her so much. I want to thank her interpreter for being with us and Steve Bradbury, who is uh, uh, doing the technical end of things, as well as all of our technical people here. Ladies and gentlemen, join me, please, in welcoming Jenny Lay Fleury. Hello there. Can you hear me in New York? Fantastic. Well, it's great to be here, and thank you so much for such a kind, uh, just a, a kind introduction. Uh, I'm really not that cool, so um, it's always great that somebody else mentions that. You'll discover that it's all an illusion very quickly um, as I walk through. Um, but thank you for having me in New York. I apologize for not being there in person, uh, but I'm incredibly glad that technology is such a cool thing, uh, that I can appear five hours ahead of you here in our London office in, in Paddington, not the Bear, there is a place. Um, uh, actually, I'm in the Downing Street meeting room in our Microsoft offices here. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just walk you through a little bit about what we've been up to and give you some under the covers of, you know, kind of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And hopefully, all being well, um, have some time for questions. Uh, so please store them. Uh, I'm sure you have them. I know that New Yorkers are not shy. Um, I'm aware of it. Uh, so let me, let me walk you through a little bit about what we're up to and kind of what our ethos is in, in what we're doing here um, that give you some sense 
um, of why accessibility has become such a strategic imperative at Microsoft. So the first thing to that I wallow in a little bit, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir some, it's just the definition of disability. And I really do think that it's very important that that definition changed in 2011. Uh, it used to be defined as something that was broken with an individual. It's changed to be something that is a mismatch between an individual and the environment in which they're in. I think that's really important for many reasons. Um, not just because it helps me as a person with a disability to think about things in a different way, but as a Microsoft, which is 110,000 nerds all around the world, uh, accessibility and disability becomes a design principle. And by the way, nerds is a very complimentary term in my world. Um, it's, a, it's a big compliment to be called a nerd. And as we look at the world of disability, you know this. I mean, it's huge, a billion plus. Um, and I also wallow in the fact that disability comes at any point in life. It is attributed to age. If you're not in the cool gang now, you likely will be. Um, and also it's something that you can come in and out of at any point in your life, that most of disability is acquired later in life. And by the way, the picture behind me is of a gentleman on my team called Nikkei's dog bow. Um, and I was asked recently uh, if I had hired an actor to represent disability, if I'd hired actors, I'm like, no, this guy is just too cool not to have on the page. Um, he is a, a fantastic figure of a man who wears fedoras like no one else I know, um, and uh, African-American with his cane. Uh, I don't think it gets much better than that. So all the pictures we have are of real folk on our team. So if you look at the history with Microsoft and what we've been doing over this time, there's a couple of things to, to recognize. Um, I love history. I went back into the history books of Microsoft. We've been around 42 years, uh, which I happen to know because it's my age, which I'll then very quickly move on. Uh, no woman should ever disclose their age, um, but I've just done it. And it, actually, accessibility really began in 97 um, with a gentleman called Bill Gates, who you may know, um, who announced accessibility as an area of priority for the company 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago. And at the same time, our first employee groups were coming in. And our employee groups, the first ones were ADD, our huddle group, which is our deaf community, our parents of children with autism, which remains our largest community at Microsoft still today, and VIP, which is visually impaired persons. I know is not the most correct politically, uh, politically correct term, but it's a community that loves being called VIPs. Who would? Um, now that. That community has grown. And when I joined the company back in 2005, actually here in London, before I relocated over to Seattle a couple of years later, uh, there were six groups. There's now 15. Um, and the 15 groups represent the full spectrum of disability, with a few exceptions that we're still to add in. The latest groups are in areas that I think are in the invisible category, which, as we know, is about 90%, 70% of disability is invisible. So our new groups are areas like post-traumatic stress, eating disorders, traumatic brain injury, and more. Um, and I look forward to seeing that group evolve into areas of mental health. And my, my entry here was really through my own deafness. I am severely, profoundly deaf. Uh, I joined the company at Microsoft thinking that it would be a great person for a deaf, a great company for a deaf person, and then quickly found that actually, contrary to my belief, Microsoft actually like they like to talk to one another, in meetings, over one another, with lots of accents and loud voices, and uh, quickly found that I struggled with that. You know, I had this illusion that they would all like to talk to one another by email. Not the case. And so once I joined the deaf community, I got nosy. I joined all the others. And I found that they were all saying some of the same stuff, which was, how can I w talk to my manager about this? How do I self-identify? Aren't we a technical company? And shouldn't we be doing something crazy in this space? Uh, so I was chair of that group. We formed that group, um, which has grown. And that Ability Summit referenced earlier 
uh, was 80 people eight years ago, and I was cheering down the corridors like a mad lunatic. Um, and now that same conference has, on average, had between 800 and 1,000 attendees internally at Microsoft every year. Um, and next month, I'm actually heading back over the pond, um, back to Seattle, to get ready for the next annual conference, which is in May. Um, and for the first time, we are opening the doors to the public. Uh, so we're very excited and horribly terrified um, to see what happens. So a couple of years ago, um, things started to take a really big shift at Microsoft, and we decided to really lean into all of the employee goodness and that opportunity with technology. I think over 20 years, um, many of you who probably used our technology would probably support me in saying this. We've had moments of brilliance and moments of not. Um, and we wanted a couple of years ago to really take an opportunity to reboot it at Microsoft. That's when I moved into the role of Chief Accessibility Officer, which really is a fancy title that means that my job is to embed disability and accessibility into the DNA of Microsoft. And my job really is to make sure that it's as part of our culture, that it's part of how we work, it's part of how we communicate, part of our product and find that way to really motivate the company to do some crazy things. And there are four pillars to how we set out to do it. And I'm really thrilled that you know, a couple of years on now, I can tell you that some of this has started to really drive a big impact for us, albeit with a long way to go. I don't think accessibility ever has an end destination. And so the first of those four is our culture. And I think culture it's something that we all know about, but it's actually very simple at the core. It's about making sure, if you're going to build accessibility into the heart of what you do, that you have people with disabilities at the heart of what you do. So we've been very, very focused at bringing in... You can clap, it's good. I can't hear you, but I, I can see it. Um, but it's bringing people with disabilities in. I'm keeping going. We're on a time clock here, people. Um, I, it, and there's really three ways that we've done this. And there's a lot more information than what I'm going to tell you, OK? And, um, and there is a few websites that are embedded into some of this literature that we will make sure you get. Um, but three ways I'll quickly call out. Uh, one is focusing on developmental disability. Um, we've actually been focused on this for quite some time. Um, and that's how you bring people into jobs like in our gardens, in our kitchens. We've had over 200 hires in the Seattle area with 1% attrition. It's how you also folk in broad disability. And I'll tell you that Gold Dust is a blind developer. That is Gold Dust. I cannot get enough. Uh, and I, it's really simple if you just think about it. If you are a blind developer, you are developing accessible code by design. Right? We're not having to fix anything or remedy anything or educate. Uh, we're just, it's built into the product. And the other one is autism, where we've been deeply focused on how we can bring people with autism in, um, which is an area that is untapped. The unemployment, underemployment is over 80%. But a lot of these guys and girls have insane education in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And inclusive design is the other one that I'll call out on culture, because inclusive design means that you're building accessibility into your product just by designing. It means that you do it at the beginning. You should never do it at the end. Um, and so every person at Microsoft gets trained on this. Um, whether you're building a fancy office like the beautiful one here in Paddington or in Seattle, or you're working on the next version of Windows. And I think the other second pillar as I move through is talking about transparency. And this is a very customer-focused mindset. So one of the things as I migrated from uh, my, my job before I lived and breathed accessibility 24-7, I used to be a technical support leader. That was what I did. I actually joined the company to work on Hotmail. If anyone remember, are they old enough to remember the room Hotmail with the butterfly? Yes. Uh, but how do you make sure that you have all the information on every product at your fingertips 
So as you're walking, in, walking into a workplace and you see that they're using Excel, you can go and check that Excel to make sure that that version, what, what works great, what have I got to work around? Does it work with JAWS? Does it work with Narrator? What, what, give me that info. So every single product, every conformance statement is new and it's loaded onto our site and we've redone the site. Some of you remember the old one which was really good. My thumbs down. We've redone it. It's Microsoft.com slash accessibility. Um, and that's all the information on our products. And also, we've tried to chunk it into documents that will help you. So you'll see two sways here, uh, which are presentation documents. And they have every single feature in every single one of our products, from Windows to Xbox, broken down by disability type. And these are simple things that you can go online and, and check out. We keep them up to date with everything coming out. And there is a lot coming out. And the same with all of our inclusive hiring practices. Because if we're going to change the unemployment rate, which is double that for people with disabilities, we have to hire around 500,000 people with disabilities into the US workforce. Microsoft only has 110. We have to work together to drive the employment of people with disabilities. So we give every piece of knowledge that we've learned, we put it out, and we document, and we share it. A couple of other things I'll linger on, um, and I'll show you a couple of videos. One is Disability Answer Desk. Who's heard of it? Disability Answer Desk? Anyone? A couple of you. Well, if you don't, um, and in fact, actually, that we, we call this DAD. That's their acronym. I have no mom. I have a dad team. Um, an actual fact, I will tell you that my dad is actually in the room with me here in London. I bring you dad work day here in, uh, in London. Um, but dad is a, is a simple 1-800 number away. It's free support for customers with disabilities using accessible tech. We've just added a channel within Be My Eyes, which is a great free app. If you haven't tried it, please do. We take about 300,000 calls a year. Um, and those calls are gold dust. We get to hopefully help you get with your use of technology, get up and running if you've got a problem, or figure out what is the right AT for you, give you some advice on what's available. And then we also get feedback from you. We get to hear what's working, what's not. If there's things we've got to fix, and all of that feedback goes right back to the engineers who get stuff fixed. So it's gold dust. In fact, let me give you this quick little video that shows you. I think that the Disability Answer Desk is a really great thing. David Bouchard, a Be My Eyes user, describes his experience. I use the Be My Eyes app uh, pretty frequently. I use it to get visual information that otherwise wouldn't be available to me, such as a uh, maybe a sign, a LED screen. Senior Technical Advisor Chitra speaks from the Microsoft Disability Answer Desk Center. At Microsoft Disability Answer Desk, we provide free technical support for customers with disabilities. With this integration with Be My Eyes, we can help you with tasks like installing Office 365, troubleshooting your internet connection, or even learning about the physical characteristics of your new Surface Book. The service offers free technical support for people with disabilities. All the users have to do is go ahead and click on the specialized help, and there is an option for them to contact the Microsoft Disability Answer Desk to help them with any technical issues they have. Free app for iOS and Android. Thank you for calling the Microsoft Disability Answer Desk. How can I assist you today? It really takes away the visual barrier that sometimes exists. Because it's a free service, I'm really pleased that it augments the skills that I have. We want to make sure we give our best service to our customers when and how they want. Everyone who's blind and has a smartphone should have it on their phone. I really applaud Microsoft for taking this step. Learn more at aka.ms forward slash be my eyes. Microsoft. Kind of fun, right? Um, and yes, we do audio describe our videos. I actually have an in house team that audio describes all of our videos. And so let me give you 
a couple of really quick things that have come out of focus on this culture. And I'm going to give you some really quick examples. The first one I'm going to talk about is learning tools. This isn't for blindness, this is for dyslexia. And it came out of a hackathon. Who's hacked? Anyone know what a hack is in the room? Oh, people. Some of you, maybe. A hackathon is really where you get a bunch of people, a crazy idea, and no light, a lot of coffee, a lot of pizza, and you spend some time really figuring out how to solve a problem. This was how could you solve reading rates? How could you help empower kids with dyslexia to increase their reading rates? And we, they created learning tools. It's now in, our, in Microsoft Word. It's in Office Lens. It's in Edge, our browser, which is accessible. Um, and it, it really is showing to help kids increase their reading rates. And we've proven that it gives them a 10% jump. And it just separates words, separates syllables, gives different colors. It gives extra spacing. Stuff that we found out scientifically can help these kids and adults uh, to read documents more quickly. Another quick one, accessibility checker. Um, this actually has been around for a long time, but it was hidden in some mystery menu, deep, dark, in the, in the sort of basement of Microsoft Office, and no one could find it. So we moved it next to spell check. Um, and it increased overnight by 5x. And it allows you, it's all now across everything that we do in Microsoft Office, pretty much including Visio, which is our flow chart part of Office. And it allows you to check your, your whatever it is, an email, a Word document, and make sure that it's accessible before you send it out. Right? Incredibly important. And we're going to be working more on this one. So watch this space. This is, a, this is a cool one that's getting some work on it right now. Another one that's come out of this work is Presentation Translator. And this brings in artificial intelligence. Don't think about robots. Think about the good side of AI. Um, and this is how you can bring artificial intelligence to give you real-time captioning. In fact, it's so accurate that while my wonderful, incredible interpreter, who will never be replaced by tech, trust me, because uh, I get so much out of ASL, um, but it gives that extra independence because the quality of the captions are so good. And it's now embedded into PowerPoint. So you can click one button and have English to English. Or you could just log into it from your phone and pick any language you want. It, just, it doesn't work just for people with disabilities. It works for everyone. And AI is beginning to have a big influence on everything that we do. AI is helping us with alt text. Five years ago, I did a bit of a survey to see what the most common alt text was on some of our document repositories. And you guys will laugh. Um, I'm predicting. But the most common alt text was, this is a picture. I think, I mean, you, right? So we got to what we're now doing is using AI. So now we, you know, we, we educate humans on how to write alt text, right? And we're educating and educating on how to write good alt text. But technology can help. With image recognition, you can now put your picture into PowerPoint or into Word, and narrator will automatically go down the page and add in what it thinks the alt text is if it isn't in there. Um, and it will tell you how good it thinks it is and give you the ability to edit it. Um, so AI can help. It will never replace, but it can help. And when you start combining this and our work that we've been doing on Narrator and the work that we are doing on magnification, color blindness filters that are now in Windows, if you think about eye control, we, you can now move a mouse and scroll a mouse. Uh, using just your eyes and a very small $150 device. If you've got deafness going on, you can use translator to understand what someone's saying. You can also use dictate functions right within Office that if you speak into it, it will write it on the page. We're starting to create a more inclusive environment. And if I think about a table full of kids in a classroom, I can imagine Hopefully, with what we have now, let alone what's coming down the pipe, that kids like me when I was younger 
and many others will be able to sit around a table and not have to disappear off for specialized education. Um, while that's incredibly valuable, you can sit around and be inclusive with your friends, just using your technology in your way to access whatever's in front of you. There's an incredible power that technology, I hope, can bring, and that's the vision of what keeps us driven. And then I'll close up by talking about innovation for one minute, and I think we'll have maybe a couple of minutes for questions. I, I know we're running a little hot on time. Um, but just a couple of uh, examples on innovation. You know, that hackathon I mentioned, um, and one of the big drivers and motivators in the company uh, is just creating new wicked stuff, new crazy stuff. We love cool toys. Um, who doesn't? Uh, but it motivates people. We actually started hacking in 2014. And in 2014, I had 10 projects and 75 people hacking on ability hacks. That included eye gaze. And that was the first time that we really invested in that space. And in two days, with no light, coffee, a lot of duct tape, duct tape is very important, we created an eye gaze wheelchair, moving a wheelchair with just your eyes. And we thought that was amazing. Last year, same hackathon, which we do for a week every year, I had 150 projects and 850 Microsoft employees hacking. Um, and some of the projects that have come up, well, you might know one of them, seeing AI. Seeing AI was a hackathon project. And in fact, I'll tell you that the, uh, the, the hack team first put this project and they walked around with cameras taped to their heads. And we all thought they were slightly bonkers. Um, but that's what they did. They walked around Microsoft cafeterias with phones taped to their heads, seeing if they could read the menus. And that was, that was what they did in the hackathon. Seeing AI with a year's work launched last summer. Um, we've now had over 3 million interactions using Seeing AI and over 130,000 people have given None of us, none of us anticipated this, but it is all based on AI. You know, some of the stuff that we launched a couple of months ago, and if you haven't played with this, do play. Um, handwriting, colors, currency, um, and you, all of those channels are now available. Uh, and it's, it's such an exciting area for us, and I can't wait to see uh, what we do next here. But there is one other example that actually came out of where I am in London. In fact, one of the greatest times I ever had was in Paddington, London, demoing this project a few years ago. And back then, it was just really an idea but we launched this one a couple of, uh, in fact, a few weeks ago. Let me play this one and, and let you give a sense. This is Soundscape. A busy city street, Maya with her guide dog. Good boy, steady. Steady, good boy. Aaron Lauridson, Lighthouse, San Francisco. We want to explore our world in the same ways that everybody else wants to explore their world. Outdoor. Donning a headset. Soundscape fills in a lot of the mental map as you move. It makes it effortless and seamless to know what's around you because it's designed such that you can just put it in your pocket and go. Maya using Soundscape, walking with Alex. DSW Shoe Warehouse. DSW Shoe Warehouse. Cool things happening around town here. <laughs> when I'm with other people, I'm able to gather a lot of the same information my sighted friends or family are getting from the signage around me. And with that, I'm able to participate in, hey, look, what's over there? Disable. Oh, Disable is showing up here as well, which is one of my favorite stores. Oh, really? Yeah. Those moments that don't usually happen for me in my life. David, walking in the park. Using the technology is relatively easy. You have to still concentrate on listening for obstacles, but you then get used to the chatter in the background and you can pick out suddenly something that's of interest to you. Shona around town. It was great telling me all the different shops as I passed, which is lovely. And the different street names as well. Quite often I don't know 
you know, which street's which. Approaching intersection, Battery goes right. Maya, touching phone screen. We have a, a beacon set for Nike store, 248 yards. The beacon has been helpful in approaching different addresses and places in busier areas. Arm extended, pointing with her phone. I'm getting the bell right about here. Great, so let's just head off that way. Okay, forward. Passing through an open market. It's been a unique experience to work with the Soundscape team. They have been so transparent, forthcoming, open to feedback. It's been a really dynamic relationship. You have blind people on your team, you're working deeply with agencies like Lighthouse and reaching out and engaging with blind people in different places and from different backgrounds and really making sure that what's being created is aligned with the needs of the community. Ah, Fiddler forward. Naki store. Good boy. Left inside. Entering the store. Woohoo! Okay. Hi, how are you today? Logo of Guide Dogs UK. Logo of Lighthouse, San Francisco. Microsoft, empowering every person to achieve more. Thank you so much. So, you know, and I will say that both those projects started, um, seeing AI started with an architect here in London who's blind. Soundscape started as a project of another architect who's blind called Amos Miller, um, uh, who was also based here in London. He's now based over in Redmond. And so it speaks and comes full circle. Having people with disabilities at the core of what, everything that we do produces things like this. There's a lot more that we need to do, but I'm excited about where we are. So with that, I'm not sure where we are in time. I don't know if we have time for any questions, but I'm game on if you do. Um, if not, I will give you our simple, um, my Twitter, which don't laugh, is Jenny Lay Fluffy. Um, and also, yeah, our, no, I saw that. Um, and also our broad company one, which is MSFT Enable, which are our two Twitter accounts. Um, and also Disability Answer Desk is a great way uh, to get hold of us with any questions uh, that you have. Yes. So with that, let me stop talking. Yes, Jenny, uh, hello, my name is Mike, and um, I gathered, I'm here with uh, 250 New York nerds, of which I am the 249th, and so thank you very much for, for this. I, what I did before the conference is I, I went around and, and gathered only about 65 questions for you, of which I'm going to uh, give you about three. All the other 62 will be sent to you, and I'm sure we'll be able to get, get through uh, t uh, with, with you. Um, a couple of themes came through as I talked to our attendees. And well, one of the themes was really having to do with the extent to which accessibility features are really baked into Microsoft and, and, and all of the Microsoft products, uh, particularly making sure that the icons are on the desktop front and center and really are available and, and people can, can uh, perceive them, can uh, see them, can whatever, and get it very quickly. And kind of a related question to that, I guess the question really is, to what extent are changes that we can anticipate for Microsoft going to impact the ability of, uh, for accessible software to be as accessible as it needs to be? No, great question. Um, you, oh my god, there's so many different ways I could answer that. So. I will say that every product that we have, I mean, there's about 60 plus different permutations of Office, for example, and Windows launches twice a year. Uh, very different, you know, things are moving a lot quicker in the technology world than I say they, they did do when I first joined the company. Um, but every time that we launch, everything is rigorously checked. Now, do we, do we miss things occasionally? Of course. Um, and, you know, that does happen. And we really do encourage people, if you are at all technically nerdy, early adopter, if you're comfortable with slight bugs and issues, do join our insiders community, uh, which is where you get the first revs of the product even before they go to market, uh, because then you can help us to see things. You know, we test across the spectrum of disability, in particular, a lot of depth on screen reader use um, and magnification use uh, and high contrast. But you know, clearly, we do check stuff before it comes out. Because uh, our goal is to ensure that every version we have doesn't just meet 
legal bar, it goes way beyond, right? We're all about usability of what we're doing. So whether it's Excel, Sway, PowerPoint, Xbox, uh, Windows, uh, and some of our enterprise products coming through, we really do want you to be able to trust what we're putting out. Um, and so that also then means that when we do have those products coming out, uh, we put all of the information on the website. And I would also suggest keeping an eye on our blogs because all of the roadmaps I try to publish ahead of time, as do many of my the community of leaders across the business that I work with. Um, and so you'll actually find roadmap blogs that call out things coming up in the future. One of the things coming up is we're making it easier for you to be able to find and turn on and turn off accessibility. So you will be able to, this is in the uh, full release, uh, you'll be able to activate all of the accessibility features by using Cortana, um, our speech recognition engine. Um, and in the meantime, it's Windows Key U. Windows Key U is the shortcut. Um, and then you can bring everything up. So there's a lot more that we want to do to make it easier to find, easier to use. Um, but I really want trust. I, you know, and that means a big responsibility uh, for us and the incredible, you know, incredible folks I work with back at Bay. Okay, and I'll, I'll just do, because time is of, uh, shortening, shortening right now, I'll, I'll just give one more question. But I, I'll, it's sort of a fill-in-the-blank question. Many people ask are curious about when certain products are going to be available. And the one that I heard many times over and over is Office for Mac. Um, many people are curious about Office uh, for the Mac. Is that going to be uh, in, in the, on the Microsoft horizon? Office for Mac is out today. Office 365, check it out. It's, it's great for accessibility. The I. Yeah, am I miss I if I'm missing something? Okay. I we'll, thought you we'll, were gonna ask we'll me for like when's the next version of Xbox coming, well, in which case you'd have got no, I can't answer that. No, we're more basic um, than that. Okay. But Office for Mac, um, Office for the iPhone, Office for Android, Office for Desktop are all out today. And I do stress the best version for accessibility, Windows 10, Office 365. Okay. And then lastly, um, why is Edge not more accessible? Microsoft Edge. It is. Um, <laughs> it is. Um, I will say, we, we, we worked on that. Um, now, is it perfect? No. There are definitely some things we're still working on. But whether you're using it with JAWS, NVDA, Narrator, all three, <laughs> oh, thumbs up. Um, now, was it two years ago? No, we've definitely had to work and address that. And we did get feedback. But try Edge, um, and I stress there are a few things we're still on it. Um, but you know, let me know your feedback. I'm all ears that they are deaf, but I do read. <laughs> well, we will we will send you. I will be sending you the other 63 questions that we weren't able to get through today. Thank you very much. That's great. I have a very long flight. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, London. Thank you, Joe and Victor and Mike. Hello, my name is Professor Heather Schultz. I teach speech communication at Brew College. I'm also a proud alumna of Brew College, and I'm here today with... Hi, world. Uh, my name is Nefertiti Matos. I'm an assistive technology instructor for the New York Public Library at this time. And we're here today to share our thoughts on Jenny LeFlores, Chief Accessibility Officer at Microsoft, her inspiring speech. So Nefertiti, uh, yes. what, do you, what do you think about her inspiring talk? Oh my goodness, I think it was, it was beyond inspiring. Um, I, she herself, her presentation, I found to be very witty. She is very expressive, charming in, in her delivery, very informative. I, as an accessibility instructor, uh, accessibility technology instructor, excuse me, learned quite a bit about Microsoft initiatives, both in the works and, com you know, in, in process. Um, she mentioned Seeing AI and Soundscape, both apps made and um, developed by blind engineers, which is wonderful. I'm a firm believer in, um, you know, anything about us 
with us in mind, anything by us, for us, that kind of thing. So that was really exciting to learn that the engineers are blind themselves. Um, in case anybody's wondering, Seeing AI and uh, Soundscape are both free apps that you can get in the um, iOS App Store. And uh, they are fantastic. I could go on and on about them, but I'll give it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Nefertiti. I thought it was interesting. So Jenny Leifler was discussing how there are 110 people with disabilities at Microsoft and how that we need to build the collective of people with disabilities in the workforce. Do you have any ideas how to do so and raise that employment rate for people with disabilities? Well, I think she broached it very, very, um, I guess, correctly, and she hit the nail right on the head. If you want more people in the workforce, then maybe the key is to provide tools that they can use independently so that they can reach those goals, right? Make the technology, make the workspaces accessible so that people with disabilities can access them. We are one of the most educated populations there are, yet our, our job availability, and because of stigma, because of stereotyping, whatever the case is, implicit bias, whatever, really holds us back. And one of the ways I think to even the playing field is through technology, because our education and definitely our desire to succeed is already here. What else, which I thought was, what else what I thought was interesting was she was saying that when they're designing a product that they think about accessibility from the beginning and as an avid Microsoft user, that really makes me really happy. How does that make you feel? Oh, it, it thrills me because rather than being some afterthought quick fix, you know, once the complaints come in and once people with disabilities productivity has been interrupted to like the 10 million, per, you know, power or what have you, it's already ready-made. You can, and by you I mean the person with the disability, can purchase this product and use it with the assurance that you will have access to it like anyone else, rather than, again, being some stopgap measure after your productivity has been, you know, just sort of derailed simply because you don't have this equal access to the technology as everyone else. That's really unfair. So it was very exciting to hear that they're building from the ground up with accessibility in mind. So Jenny Leifleury was also talking about Microsoft's inclusion approach across company culture, the products, investing into the future. What do you think about that and how can that move on to other industries besides technology? Well, again, I think it was wonderful. I was really, really um, encouraged by how she presented and by the things she was saying that are you know, in the works and coming. If seeing AI, again, a free app in the App Store, um, that really within one app you access about six, seven different crucial things like currency identification, um, color identification, OCR, which is the ability to snap a picture and, and have some, you know, inaccessible print material now being spoken to you out loud by a synthesizer and other, other, a lot of other, um, uh, a lot of other features, excuse me, within that one app where before we would have to download tons of apps and try them out and see if they work the way they promised. Now we have this one app backed by this huge world known and renowned company. And I think that if Microsoft is investing in us and keeping us, the disabled community, you know, in their, in their crosshairs, if you will, and catering to us and understanding that we are a viable population, um, then I hope, I trust that other companies uh, within other industries will follow suit. Because again, if this huge company is taking the time and the effort to invest in us and to consider us as, uh, <laughs> you know, people who can make them money, if nothing else, um, then I think that's very encouraging to other companies and they too will follow suit. I thought, also thought it was interesting how Jenny Leifler was talking about removing the stigma as children and separating children from their friends into specialized classes. What are your thoughts on that? 
I think that's great. As she said, there is value in, in this method. I, I happen to think there is some value, but I also think and firmly believe that what we want is equality, like any other minority group, any other marginalized uh, folks in the world. What we want is to have a seat at the table, right? Not just appreciate the crumbs that fall from it. So rather than separating the child with a disability into a group with other children with disabilities, why not put them in the same classroom so that they have you know, the opportunity, excuse me, the opportunity to thrive like any other student, have the same access to um, the education that is being given through the technology that's accessible to everyone, right? Like when I use my iPhone, when I first got an iPhone in 2008, it changed my life. I had the same phone as my sister, as my cousins, as just about everyone else, and I felt like wow, so this is what it means, this is how it feels to be a part of something, to belong to something, to be just like everyone else. I know we're supposed to be individuals, etc., but sometimes it feels good to have the same thing that everyone else has, whether or not you use it in the same way. So this idea of a more inclusive teaching environment, more inclusive education, where everybody is at the same place at the same time, whether or not they're using the tools at their disposal in the same way, as long as they're getting it done and they're learning, then yes, I'm all for having everyone together. Thank you so much, Nefertiti. So you're basically saying that it's a matter of human rights. So, oh, yeah. so when is this movement happening for your community? When is it happening? I'd like to think it's been happening. It's happening right now. These types of conferences here, the, the CCVIP conference, which by the way is very excitingly, um, Dean Clarkson announced today that it's being renamed the Karen L. Gorgi conference. That was very touching, because Karen is wonderful. Um, this conference is, is one of those ways, bringing up the awareness, raising awareness, as you said, that it is a human rights issue. Um, and that it, it's something that needs and should continue to be done. Um, and I'm hopeful that it will continue because this isn't something, you know, that just like, when does this happen and snap everybody, you know, everybody's in the same classroom, accessing the same uh, stuff in theaters or airplanes or et cetera. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of advocacy. It takes a lot of breaking down those barriers that we are people too. And, you know, conferences like this, consumer organizations like the National Federation of the Blind and um, American Council of the Blind advocacy groups for and by blind people are making great strides through, uh, for this through legislation, et cetera. So it takes a lot of hard work, but it's getting done. And someday, I don't know, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, like I was saying, I'm very hopeful that this forward momentum will continue and that this will become a more inclusive world day by day. Thank you so much for your time, Nefertiti, and thank, thank you, you for tuning into the live stream today.